It was the year 48 BCE, and the violent civil war between Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great was tearing the Roman world apart. Battlefields across Italy and Greece were strewn with Roman dead from both sides, as a once mighty empire gutted itself with its own swords. Descending from Gaul across the Rubicon, sweeping upon Italy like lightning, Caesar had forced away Pompey's army and much of the Roman Senate, who fled before his advancing legions. Pompey stood resolute, but his reputation hung on victories now long since past, like a mighty but aging oak whose imposing glories were fading year by year. Commanding the loyal forces of the Republic, Pompey had moved his forces out of Italy, into northern Greece, to regroup and buy more time. But Caesar had crossed the sea and was fast descending upon them. The climactic battle now loomed as the two forces drew near on the plains of Pharsalus, a place whose name would become infamous with the spilling of Roman blood. One tale is passed down about what happened on the eve of this decisive battle, in the dark of a night filled with foreboding and evil omens. Sextus Pompey was the son of the great general, anxious more than any other about the outcome of the coming showdown. So anxious was he that he turned to the dark powers that lurked nearby in Thessaly's rocky countryside and sought out the help of a fearsome witch. Erichtho was her name, and her control of the forces of the underworld, and those who dwelt beneath it, gave her the power to revive the dead, and from their decaying mouths learn prophecies from the next world. It was this witch whom Sextus Pompey sought out on that grim night before the battle. And here, in the ancient verses of the Roman poet Lucanus, that story is told. The story of Sextus, the witch, and the prophecies of the dead. When in this fated land the generals placed their sprawling camps, foreboding of the end now fast approaching, all men's thoughts were turned upon the final outcome of the war. And as the hour drew near, the fearful minds trembling beneath the shadow of the fate now hanging over them, knew disaster near. While some took heart, yet doubted what might fall, revolved in hope and dread. Amid the crowd, Sextus, unworthy son of a worthy father, could bear delay no more. His feeble soul, sick of uncertain fate, by fear compelled, forecast the future. But consulted not the shrine of Delos, nor high Delphi's caves, nor was he satisfied to learn the sound of Jupiter's cauldron amid Dodona's oaks, nor sought the sages who, by flight of birds, may know the fates to come, nor any source, pious though secret. For to him was known that which excites the hate of gods above, magician's lore, the savage creed of Dis and all the shades, and sad with gloomy rites, mysterious altars. And the spot itself kindled his madness, for nearby there lurked abhorred Arictho, steeped in sinful rites, who called no roof but cold deserted tombs her dwelling place, from where she dragged the dead. She knew the secrets hid in Hades' gloom, and learned to hear the whispered voice of ghosts in rituals grim and gruesome. Never did sun shed his pure light upon that haggard cheek pale with the pallor of the shades, 
nor looked upon those locks unkempt that crowned her brow. In starless nights of tempest crept the witch out from her tomb to seize the lightning bolt. Treading the harvest with a cursed foot, she burned the fruitful growth, and with her breath poisoned the air once pure. No prayer she breathed, nor supplication to the gods for help, nor knew the pulse of entrails as do men who worship. Funeral pyres she loves to light, and snatch the incense from the flaming tomb. The gods at her first utterance grant her prayer for things unholy, lest they hear again its fearful sound. And men whose limbs were quick with vital power she thrust within the grave, despite the fates who owed them years to come. The funeral reversed, brought forth from the tomb those who were dead no longer. And the pyre yields to her shameless clutch, still smoking dust and bones enkindled, now with fragments mixed in thick black smoke and dressings white with ash, singed with the redolent fire that burned the dead. But those who lie within a stony cell, untouched by fire, whose dried and mummied frames no longer know corruption, limb by limb, venting her rage, she tears, the bloodless eyes drags from their cavities and mauls the nail upon the withered hand. She gnaws the noose by which some wretch has died, and from the tree drags down a hanging corpse freshly decayed. Nor fears she murder, if her rights demand blood from those still living. Her hand has chased from smiling cheeks the rosy bloom of life, and with sinister hand from dying youth has shorn the fatal lock. And holding tight in foul embraces, some departed friend has severed the head, and through the ghastly lips, held to her own, revealed a grisly tale, dark with horror from the shades of Styx. When rumor brought her name to Sextus, in the depth of night, while Titan's chariot beneath our earth wheeled on his middle course, he took his way through fields deserted with a faithful band, seeking the witch amid broken sepulchres. They beheld her seated on the crags afar, where Hymus falls towards Pharsalus's plain, where she was proving for her gods and priests words still unknown, and framing numbered chants of dire and evil purpose. To her the coward son of Pompey spoke. Great sorceress, in whose power it lies to summon up the fates, or from its course to change the future, be it mine to know by your sure utterance to what final end fortune will guide the battle. Not the least of all the Roman men on yonder plain am I, but Pompey's most illustrious son, lord of the world, or heir to death and doom. The unknown scares me. Bid my destiny yield to your power the dark and hidden end, and let me fall for knowing. From the gods extort the truth, or if you spare the gods, force it from hell itself. Fling back the gates that bar the Elysian fields, let death confess whom from our ranks he seeks. No humble task I bring, but worthy of Erichtho's skill, of such a struggle fought for such a prize, to search and tell the outcome. Then the witch, pleased that her infamous fame was wide abroad, thus made her answer. Child, if you are content to know the answer preordained, that shall be swiftly yours. Too easy is it, where death in these Thessalian fields abounds, to snatch a single corpse. From dead men's lips, hardly cold, in fuller sound comes forth the voice not from some dried-up husk in voices shrill, uncertain to the ear. <laughs> Thus spoke the witch, and through the deep of night, a squalid veil cloaking her pallid features, stole among unburied Roman dead. Fast fled the wolves, the carrion birds, with mouth unsatisfied, relaxed their talons, 
as with creeping step she sought her prophet. Firm must be the flesh as yet, though cold in death, and firm the lungs, untouched by wounds. At length the witch Erichtho picks her victim out, with throat agape, fit for her purpose. Pierced by her sharp hook, over rocks she drags him to a mountain cave, accursed by her fell rites that shall restore the dead man's life. Close to the hidden brink, the land that girds the precipice of Hades sinks towards the depths. With ever-falling leaves, a forest shadows, and a spreading tree casts shade impenetrable. Foul decay fills all the space, and in the deep recess, darkness unbroken, save by chanted spells, reigns always there. The dread Erichtho saw the friends of Sextus trembling, and himself with eyes cast down, and set upon her work. First through the Roman corpse's chest she pours blood still fervent, washing out his wounds. Then copious poisons from the moon distills, mixed with all monstrous things which nature's pangs bring to untimely birth. The froth from dogs, stricken with madness, foaming at the stream. A lynx's entrails, and the knot that grows upon the fell hyena. The flesh of stags fed upon serpents, dragon's eyes, and stones that sound beneath the brooding eagle's wings, Arabia's viper, and the ocean snake in Red Sea's waters. Then last came her voice, more potent than all herbs, to charm the gods who rule in Hades. Dissonant murmurs first, and sounds discordant from the tongues of men she utters, scarce articulate. The bay of wolves, and barking as of dogs were mixed with that fell chant. The screech of nightly owl raising her hoarse complaint, the howl of beast and sibilant hiss of snake, all these were there, and more. The waft of waters on the rock, the sound of forests, and the thunder peal. Such was her voice. But soon in clearer tones, reaching to Tartarus, she raised her song. O oh, goddesses of dread, avenging powers of Hades on the damned, and chaos huge, and Pluto, king of earth, whose weary soul grieves at his godhead. Styx, and plains of bliss we may not enter. And you, Proserpina, hating your mother and the skies above, my patron goddess, last and lowest form of Hecate, through whom the shades and I hold silent conversation and you, fateful sisters, who shall spin the threads again. And you, O boatman of the burning wave, now wearied of the shades from hell to me returning. Hear me, if with voice I cry, abhorred, polluted. From the caves hid in the innermost recess of Dis, I claim no soul long banished from the light. For one but now departed, Lingering still upon the brink of Orcus is my prayer. Grant, for you can, that listening to the spell once more he seeks his dust. And let the shade of this our Roman soldier perished speak the destiny of Pompey to his son. Such prayers she uttered then her foaming lips and head uplifting, she saw the ghost appear. Right there he stood, beside the hated corpse, his fleshy prison, and shrank from entering in. There was the yawning gash where fell the blow that was his death, and yet the gift supreme of endless sleep was torn away. And yet the corpse grew warm, and with a softening touch blood pumped the stiffening wounds and filled the veins, till throbbed once more the slow returning pulse, and every fiber trembled as with death life was commingled. Then, not limb by limb, with toil and strain, but rising at a bound, leapt from the ground, the living corpse stood up. 
Fierce glared his eyes uncovered, and the life was dim, and still upon his face remained the pallid hues of hardly parted death. Amazement seized upon him, to the earth brought back again. Now speak, commands the witch, as I shall bid thee. Great shall be your gain if but you answer truly, freed forever from the witch's art. Such burial place shall now be yours, and on your funeral pyre such fatal words shall burn, such chant shall sound, that to your ghost no more or magic song or spell shall reach, and your infernal sleep shall not again be broken by new life. Obscure may be the answers of the gods by priestesses spoken at the holy shrine, but those who brave the oracles of death in search of truth shall gain a clear response. So speak, I pray thee, let the hidden fates tell through your voice the mysteries to come. So she spoke. The corpse with downcast face and tears fast flowing made his grim reply. Called from the banks of the silent stream of sticks, I saw no fateful sisters spin the threads. Yet I know this, Amid the ghosts of Romans, violent strife is reigning, and this war destroys the peace that ruled the fields of death. Elysian meads and deeps of Tartarus, in paths diverse the Roman heroes leave and thus disclose the fates. The honored shades bear visages of sorrow. Father and son, the Decii, who gave themselves to death in expiation of their country's doom, and great Camillus wept, and Sulla's shade resented fortune. Scipio bewailed the latest of his clan about to fall in sands of Libya. Cato, greatest foe to Carthage, grieves for the indignant son who won't surrender. Only Lucius Brutus in all the ranks I saw appeared content, first consul when the kings were thrust from Rome. The chains were fallen from treasonous Catiline, him too I saw rejoicing, and the pair of Marii and Cathegus's naked arm. The Drusi, heroes of the people, joyed in laws unlawful, and the famous pair of Gracchi, daring brothers. Guilty mobs by bars eternally shut within the doors that lock the jail, applaud. But take with thee this comfort, son of Pompey. Calm abodes and peaceful wait your father and his clan. Nor let the glory of a little span disturb your brooding heart. The hour shall come when all the leaders meet. Shrink not from death, but glowing in the greatness of your souls, even from your humble sepulchres descend, and tread beneath your feet in pride of place, the wandering phantoms of the gods of Rome. Caesar and Pompey, which by Tiber's stream, and which by the flooding Nile shall meet his end, this fight decides. O oh, pitiable blood, Europe and Asia and Africa's plains, the lands which saw your conquests now shall hold your graves. Nor has all the earth for you a safer land than here in Pharsalus. His prophecy given, the corpse stood mournfully, asking for death again yet could not die till mystic herb and magic chant prevailed. For nature's law, once used, had power no more to slay the corpse and set the spirit free. With plentiful wood, Erichtho built the pyre, on which the dead man climbed, 
and rolling flames seized on his grateful form. Young Sextus Pompey sought his father's camp, and as the dawn now streaked the heavens by the witch's spell, the day was stayed till Sextus reached his tent, and mist and darkness veiled his safe return. <laughs>